This is Dan Schneider. On this Dan Schneider video interview, I'm doing another show on universal basic income. My two guests are Guy Standing, an economist, and Talal Rafi, one of the heads of the Movement for Universal Basic Income in Sri Lanka. And the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is universal basic income. I have two guests. On the left is Guy Standing. Guy is an economist. Guy, if I could ask you to just give a couple of minutes background about yourself and why you support the idea of universal basic income. Uh, yes, I'm an economist <clears throat> with a PhD from Cambridge University, and I've been advocating basic income for the whole of my professional career. In 1986, with several friends, we established the BIA, the Basic Income European Network, as it then was. And since then, we have been campaigning and doing research on basic income. And in 2004, at our, our biannual conference, which was held in Barcelona that year, we renamed ourselves BIA with changing the Europe into Earth Network. We wanted to keep the acronym, but thousands of people have been joining from across the world, and I'm delighted to see that now there's a movement in Sri Lanka, as there are in 30, 35 other countries. So what we've been doing is gradually extending the nature of, of the debate, and in the last 20 years, I've been involved in a number of pilots, designing, implementing, analyzing the results from various pilots. And this past couple of years has definitely been a period where we've been making more progress and mainstreamed to a much greater extent the whole debate around basic income. So I'm, I'm quietly confident that we've become uh, mainstreamed and there are good reasons for that later in our discussion. Uh, Guy, just uh, f so you know, if you could just pull back a little bit further because you're so close up with the camera. Yeah, that's better. Uh, Talal, if you could give a little uh, background about yourself. All right. Uh, I come from a background of entrepreneurship. So uh, actually, my career started in London and then came back to Sri Lanka and uh, started a venture where it was co-working spaces. But... Uh, my actually why I wanted to go into UBI was uh, when I went to the rural parts of Sri Lanka and that is when I heard of a story where a woman had committed suicide and the reason was she had borrowed money just to feed her children from a few loan sharks and she couldn't pay that money back which she needed just to feed her children. So this caused her to like commit suicide and the children were in an orphanage. So after I saw this, I thought like, you know, there had to be a solution for this, you know, something had to be done, you know, this, this was just me looking at just one person, but there are like millions of women like this, single moms, you know, old people, orphans around the world who are suffering. So I thought like there had to be a solution where, I mean, then when I heard about universal basic income, I thought if there was a basic income, this would not have happened. You know, this person would still be alive. There would be no, I mean, what I say is like extreme poverty, the only way extreme poverty could be wiped out would be through basic income. So with that belief, I got involved in the basic income uh, project in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think like I'm, basically like the first person to have uh, started this. So, I mean, it's starting this program from scratch. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is a lot of things to be done here. So I've done a few press releases, come on national TV, and then, you know, had a 12 minute uh, uh, thing on a morning show. And other than that, I've been meeting with uh, political figures here. And especially what I feel is like, I feel this is the perfect time for you basic income in Sri Lanka, because uh, in November we have a presidential elections. So, I mean, my aim is like, if I can get enough coverage and awareness to somehow maybe not basic income in the manifestos, but if there could be something like a reference or a debate or mention in the uh, presidential elections, then that would be a great thing forward. Maybe a stepping stone to the next uh, 2025 election where UBI could be a main subject.
Well, let me ask both of you, uh, guys, since you're an, uh, an industrial, you're from an industrialized nation, the, the United Kingdom, and Talal, I believe Sri Lanka is basically a, a, a rural country. Uh, I could be wrong, but let me just ask Guy first. Uh, in a, an industrialized country, it would seem easier to get basic income than it would in a more rural country. Is that a fallacy? Yes, it is a fallacy. Um, the the interesting thing is that for many years we believed that uh, basic income was most likely to come in rich industrialized countries because the, of the presumption that the resources were there and the welfare system was developed and therefore the, the, the possibilities were greater. But in the last uh, 20 years, it's been clear that this is not the case. We've been doing pilots in India where we've been providing thousands of men, women and children with an unconditional individual basic income. And we've seen fantastic results. I listening, I remember that I was invited to Sri Lanka uh, when I was in the International Labour Organization. I was director of the socioeconomic security program. And we did a number of surveys in Sri Lanka. And I was meant to arrive on the day the tsunami uh, hit Sri Lanka. And I had to postpone, obviously. And I went there several months later to do work with colleagues in Sri Lanka. And I wrote a number of articles then saying that with the devastation, the obvious answer would be to provide basic incomes rather than have a whole lot of NGOs and international aid, aid, aid agencies rushing around the country, all duplicating work, providing boats and nets and everything in, in fast quantities, which actually made things worse and was chaotic and involved a huge waste of money Whereas what was really required in the villages and the even the towns, I remember, going around in Sri Lanka, was cash in people's hands so that they could start rebuilding their own lives in ways where they would have greater control. And I, listening to Talal's opening remarks, brought all of that back because it, at the time, I, it made me very angry because you felt that the potential for liberating and enabling people to get back on their feet was so great. So I think I think to answer your question, Dan, I, I think we found that we, with our pilots in Africa, with our pilots in India and other pilots, that in fact, in some ways, it's easier to introduce uh, a basic income in developing countries. I've just come back from Delhi, where suddenly uh, all the mainstream party political parties have some form of basic income in their manifestos for the upcoming general election. And, and I think that's entirely appropriate. But there are different challenges in different types of country. And I'm very, very happy at the prospect, I'm inundated with requests for technical advice, but I'm very happy with the prospect that we are now thinking of doing pilots in California, pilots in Ontario, pilots in Finland, pilots in the Netherlands, more pilots in Kenya and other parts of Africa. And this is gradually helping to legitimize basic income as a mainstream policy. And I, I think that this is a very uh, precious moment, a, a very uh, great opportunity where all of us who believe in what we've been advocating have got to put a lot of energy into pushing this debate forward. So programs like your, your own, like this one, and many others are helping in that process. And I'm, I'm delighted to see Talal and his colleagues setting up a network in Sri Lanka. Talal, what is your comments about uh, Sri Lanka? Do you think it's easier in a developing country to, to get UBI? Uh, yes. Well, I think that, uh, you know, when generally, when we when I started talking about uh, UBI in Sri Lanka, like some of the people, I got laughed at. Like I, they were saying, like, you know, the country is too poor and we have a very high 
debt. But then what I feel is that uh, the thing is like, we are not developed, but then also the things here in Sri Lanka are much cheaper. Like, you know, you need a lot more to get by living in the UK or the US. But in Sri Lanka, you know, you can have a good living for like one fifth the price because things cheaper. So, I mean, giving a basic income also doesn't have to be as high as in the developed Western world, but could be uh, much lower here. And uh, also the other thing is like uh, a lot of people argue that, you know, I mean, Sri Lanka, when you see, look at the revenue through taxes, almost like 90% of it goes for debt repayment, you know, to the World Bank, to the IMF. And now China has come in, you know, we owe a lot to China. But uh, unlike the developed world where, you know, I mean, the Western world has developed. So, I mean, their growth is like 2 to 3% on average. I mean, it can go high, but but there's a lot of potential to grow in Sri Lanka. Like, I mean, the developing countries, like sometimes like China in the early 2000s grew by double digits. So what I feel is like if our countries can get our economies running and grow by double digits, I mean, uh, now debt to G- GDP is like maybe 80%, but if we double our economy, it's going to come down to 40%. So, so I feel like uh, in that point of view, it's it's easier for the developing world. I mean, that's my view. I may be wrong. And uh, the other thing is like a lot goes off uh, when it comes to Sri- countries like Sri Lanka and India and all that due to corruption, like, you know, a lot through the public sector. So... Uh, recently, I had a meeting with the World Bank country director, and uh, one of the economists was saying, like, he was saying, like, you know, they are working on a program giving loans to Sri Lanka. You know, they are saying, like, they can pinpoint, like, and give welfare just specifically to people who don't have these things. But uh, what I told them is, like, I mean, uh, they don't know the reality in the ground in Sri Lanka. Like, for example, an officer, a government officer in charge of giving this much money to the poor person he may just, you know, sign their name in and uh, just pocket half the money and the money may not even go to the person. So if it was a basic income, a guaranteed thing, then everybody would know that and the money will go to them. So, I mean, this is what I think like, and, uh, and most of the things like helping these programs go to the rural people and most of the rural people are not even aware that such programs exist. So this was... So I feel like basic income can get around this because once everybody knows that this is a stipulated amount and they are, you know, they have to be given this, you know, government officials and other people cannot play around with the money. Let me ask about the political uh, ability to get a universal basic income in any country. Uh, Here in the United States where I am, uh, there's all these arguments against I mean, we still have this 1950s mentality that anything that that's vaguely socialistic is somehow going to bring reds under the beds communism. Uh, do you think that one of the reasons it's difficult to talk about UBI uh, in especially the West, but especially in the U.S., is that the money is being redistributed downward from the top rather than the American tradition of the of the rich getting the distribution upward? Uh Either one of you, if you, Guy, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I think we know the debate in the United States. It's very interesting that uh, quite a few uh, libertarians in the United States, such as Charles Murray on the right, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, and, and many of the people in Silicon Valley have come out in favor of a basic income. It's a, it's, a, it's a very remarkable development. Elon Musk, for example, has also come out in favor and a lot of other people. And I've been invited to speak about basic income in Davos, where a lot of corporate people uh, uh, have come to my, my talks and so on. And, and, and the interesting thing about it in the United States is that gradually it's being picked up by the left as well as the right. Uh, th- there are certain arguments that have to be com- uh, overcome, but I'm, I'm, I'm quietly confident that in the new political reaction to Donald Trump, there's going to be a legitimation of basic income as one of the tools 
for giving security. In my book, The Precariat, published in 2011, on page one, I said, unless the insecurities of the precariat are addressed, we will see the emergence of a political monster. And I warned in the book that, that it will lead to neo-fascism and populism of the far right. And you will not be surprised that in November 2016, I received emails from across the world saying, your monster has arrived. <laughs> and I think, I think it's a, a, very, a very worrying development that we have uh, support for far-right neo-fascists uh, with, with their racism, their misogyny, and so on. And I think this is inducing a counter-reaction on behalf of many thoughtful people that you've got to provide basic security for your citizens. And if you don't, you're going to pay a very heavy political price. I get a lot of uh, reaction now from across the United States and Canada, uh, both on the precariat and on basic income. And I think there's a much greater openness. As far as Europe is concerned, I think we are making strong headways. So you, many political parties are talking about it, green parties, new alternative parties in Spain, in Denmark, in Italy, have been putting forward proposals for basic income. I'm advising the Labour Party leadership in Britain uh, on various matters, including basic income pilots. They are now committed to doing that if they're elected in the next general election. We're seeing that in Scotland. We're seeing it in, in many parts of Europe. So I think the, the debates are rapidly developing. And I'll come back to some of the major reasons in later in this discussion. But I, I, I don't think that the standard objections which come from the right and come from the establishment in the United States, like it's giving something for nothing or it's giving people something without any sense of social response, those, or it will make people lazy and all of those standard claims I, I don't think they stand up. They don't stand up theoretically, they don't stand up intellectually, and they don't stand up empirically with all the studies that have been conducted. And I've summarized that in my recent book on basic income. So I, I, I think the momentum of change in the discussions across the world, across the world, uh, is very much in our favor. And basically, I would say to any skeptic, out there who's listening, please read what the evidence shows before you take up a strong view. Many of the points that Teller was making er earlier about suicide, about the insecurity and leading to desperate, desperate remedies is precisely what has been happening in Britain. It's been happening in the United States. These are two countries where average life expectancy has started to go down, average. And partly it is because of suicides and stress that I call one of the great giants in front of us. The, the, the stress leads to mental breakdowns, to drug addiction, to suicide attempts and actual suicides. And we've seen huge increases in all of those in rich industrialized countries. And it's because of the chronic insecurity that globalization and the technological revolution and the neoliberal policies have induced. And that, I think, is, is where the alarm bells are, are ringing and why suddenly people are saying, well, let's look at the evidence on basic income. And I, I welcome that because the evidence is very strong. Uh, before I go to Talal, just let me, you, you use the word precariat. Is that a neologism for people in a precarious financial position? The precariat consists of millions and millions of people now who are being forced to accept a life of unstable labor, okay. of unrecognized occupational identity, having to rely on volatile and low money wages without access to rights-based benefits, and who are losing the rights of citizenship. 
And I've written a lot about the precariat. My book's been translated into 24 languages, and I get I get reactions, get thousands of reactions from all over the world. And and it, a lot of people say this is about me. Yeah. I'm part of the precariat. Okay. And I've just been to India, where there's a recognizable precariat. A lot of people in in urban areas in the metropolitan cities see themselves as belonging to the precariat. Ditto in China. Ditto in Japan. It's a global phenomenon, and it's linked to the, the the need for a basic income because people in the precariat will not receive security or freedom unless we have a basic income as the base of uh, the anchor of a new income distribution system. And that argument I've developed in my books. Okay, uh, Talal, let me just ask you then yeah. about uh, what I asked uh, Guy about uh, yes. redistribution. And that, that argument. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, I think uh, basic income, like in a country like Sri Lanka, it's going to redistribute like a lot of, uh, at least the cash money around. Because uh, we live in a country like, uh, I mean, it's the same around the world, but more here, like people benefit or become successful because of connections and because of who they are born to or, yeah. you know, and the wealth passed down from the parents. Like, for example, like I come from, uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm saying like, I had the freedom to be an entrepreneur because, uh, you know, I had like parents to support me and all that. But, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are like, who have better capabilities than me, but they cannot uh, do, st uh, ha have a startup or do this because they just have to go and earn some money just to like, keep themselves from uh, starvation. So this was another argument which I was always uh, telling people in Sri Lanka, like, you know, it is a great thing for entrepreneurship as well. You know, a lot of people with a lot of talents, a lot of ideas, but, you know, their ideas can never come, come out because they just have to, like, you know, go around, you know, we live in a country where if a uh, father passes away, then the son is like responsible for everything in the house from for looking after his mother to, you know, getting his sister married or getting his younger brothers uh, to come up in life. So in, in that kind of an Eastern culture here. So, I mean, what I feel is that, you know, basic income is going to solve a lot of prob problems here. I mean, it, it's going to put everyone on a level playing field. Like when you have enough income to feed yourself, to clothe yourself and for your housing, then, you know, even someone with, uh, you know, uh, who before basic income was under extreme poverty could be the next entrepreneur, like a Zuckerberg or an Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what I feel like. Let me continue uh, with the, uh trying to put the idea of universal basic income uh, in a broader context. Here in the United States, uh, after the recent elections to Congress, in the U.S., we have something that people are banding about calling a, a Green New Deal based upon the policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which is meant to try to involve people more economically into the system. Now, uh, in, in that sense, they are looking at global warming basically, but other things too, but basically global warming as an economic opportunity to, to make the planet better, but also to involve people and, and, and help uh, the, the human welfare as well. So let me ask, uh, start with you, Guy, and ask, uh, does global warming represent an opportunity for basic income to be more acceptable because it, it seems to be spreading uh, the wealth and, and also giving more individual responsibility uh, abroad, you know, on a broader basis? Well, recently I was asked to give a TEDx talk on basic income. And I was thinking of how to present a new perspective uh, on basic income. And it was held in Como and there's a big bridge there. And I suddenly struck on an idea, uh, beverage, William Beveridge, in 1942, produced his uh, epoch-defining report for the British government, which was taken up across the Western world 
and in many ways in development strategies subsequently. And in his report, he said that it was a time for revolution, not patching, and that the challenge before uh, the world was to, to slay five giants, disease, idleness, ignorance, squalor, and want, in exact order he gave. And I realized that, in fact, we're confronted now by eight giants that are blocking the road to a good society in the 21st century. And the seventh of the eighth, which I put in, in that order, but rising concern, is the threat of extinction. This is the real ecological crisis confronting humanity. Gradually, more and more people are becoming aware of this enormous, catastrophic uh, future that we have, so that our children and grandchildren will see disappearing species, toxic air, all of the things that, that the scientists have been warning us about. And I welcome the Green New Deal that they've been putting forward in the United States. We've got green policies in, in Europe that are being advocated. And I think one of the central aspects of the Green New Deal, or should be, is the fact that we desperately need higher carbon taxes. We need eco taxes to deal with the toxic air that is killing our children, that is causing dementia and causing mental breakdowns without people realizing the damage that toxic air and global warming, the different phenomena around those things are causing. We need high carbon taxes. The tragedy is that many countries, including in South Asia, have enormous subsidies for fuel and subsidies that actually benefit the middle classes and the wealthy because they are the ones that have access to cars and electricity and other forms of, of energy use. But if you introduce carbon taxes instead of subsidies, you are actually going to have a regressive outcome. I'm an economist, so you can easily show that if you had a flat tax on fuel, for example, on fossil fuels, that the, the cost to the poor is actually going to be proportionately higher yeah. than the cost to the rich. Therefore, you're going to get unpopular politically if you just introduced high carbon tax. Now, President Macron in France found that when he just did that, he became extremely unpopular with the gilets jaunes, the yellow vests, the people who were protesting in the streets. And the great thing about that is, of course, the Canadians have done what one would hope if one's a basic income supporter. The only way to introduce carbon taxes is if you raise carbon taxes and you use the revenue that you raise by that, to give out basic dividends or basic income. Call them dividends, call them basic income. That way you will be paying for a basic income. A very large part of the payment would actually come from the carbon taxes, come from what I've called in a new book, the commons, the, the public resources that should be rechanneled. Mm -hmm. I don't think one should pitch it in terms of redistribution if I were an American politician. I would pitch it at, and we need to compensate people for the essential need for carbon taxes. Yeah. But I'm very pleased to see that across the party spectrum in the United States, among Republicans and Democrats and independents, there is now growing support for the idea of, of carbon taxes and carbon dividends. Well, that's just another name for moving towards a basic income. And I, I, I think that the, the ecological catastrophe 
is going to force a lot more people to adopt this strategy. And I'm delighted because it will deal with both the toxic air threat to a certain extent and will provide the basis of paying out basic incomes. So it will have a, a double whammy of good effects. Talal, let me just ask you a specific question since you come from a developing yeah. nation. Do you yes. think that basic income is not something that just has to be taken within each sovereign nation, but that the West, Europe, the United States, Japan, that they owe countries like your country or India or Africa, or South America, China, these developing countries, that there should be some form of subsidy? In other words, 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution kick-started yeah. this, this pollution, and the beneficiaries of it were mostly Europe and America. Mm. And for yeah. us to now say, well, that India or China, they can't develop the way we did, we have to share some of the wealth that we have. Uh, do you think that, that that's equitable? Uh, well, I don't think like uh, we can uh, ask that. Like I think... It's more of a global thing. What has happened in the past has happened. So uh, I think like uh, it's like everybody is going to be affected by this. So this is my personal view. Like many people from my country may disagree. You know, like uh, the people from India say, you know, yeah. we stupid it, and now we are on the way, and you know now they are putting it. So they need. But uh, I feel that you know we are in this boat together. So we all have to work together on this. And uh, interestingly, like uh, Sri Lanka is uh, the second most vulnerable to climate change in the world. So, I mean, we had the, this thing. So, and uh, right next to us, uh, we had the country called Maldives. And, and they have like uh, many countries in the world are giving Maldivian citizenship because uh, they say that like in a few decades, the entire, all the islands are going to be yeah. submerged. So here you get a people who are just suffering for themselves. So this is not a time where Sri Lankans and Maldivians can say, okay, we can pollute some, and then, you know, the West should like this thing, like, you know, this is a fight for life. So, I mean, I think like everybody has to be equally on this. So, I mean, the Western world, maybe they have emitted uh, all the carbon and got them uh, like become developed, but then like, it's not a time to debate on that. I think it's like uh, the world should get together and, you know, we should, cut down on this. And uh, uh, I agree with what Guy was saying about uh, subsidies in uh, uh, the developing world, especially like, uh, for example, in my country, like uh, diesel is like heavily subsidized by the government. And uh, instead of raising taxes, like, and no government has the guts to uh, get away the subsidies. I mean, the government will fall and the next election, it will be a disaster. So. It's also a thing like uh, what I say is like sometimes that's a thing about democracy. But uh, some people, they argue that, you know, China can implement all these things, but the Western world and we, Sri Lanka as a democracy is unable to. Because uh, any politician who comes in in our country, you know, they have to think about the next five years, the election in five years. So, I mean, they cannot take a long term like, an approach that is like 30 years in future or 50 years in future. So like, I'm not, I don't agree with uh, Ch the Chinese Communist Party and what they're doing, but like in China, like Xi Jinping, he can, because you know, he has been elected president for life. So, I mean, they have a thing where they put for like the next 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. but in countries like uh, Sri Lanka and in democracies, like what I feel is like when it comes to, uh, tackling climate change because most of the people have this mentality that climate change, the real effects are going to come like decades later. So, you know, we're all just, and the politicians have no, they just want to give the subsidies to get past the initial, you know, win the next election. So, right. I mean, like, uh, well, let me, let me, so I think like more of an awareness for like uh, the immediate effects of climate change that should, but uh, even like living in here and, uh, being Sri Lanka being the second most vulnerable to climate change, I don't think like uh, there is that much awareness to climate change. I mean, people would rather protest to a rising fuel than uh, if a carbon uh, tax was removed or something. So, I mean, it's more about awareness. So, that is, uh, I think it's lacking in countries.
Well, let me. The developing world. Yes. Dan. Yeah. Dan. Dan, may I make a couple of additional points? I agree with what Talal has been saying. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the unknown stories about basic income happened in Iran. Now, Iran, of course, in the United States has been demonized and been subject to uh, horrible uh, sanctions and everything, so that their development has been held back. But the Iranian government had a, a moment of wisdom when they realized that they were subsidizing uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, to 90 percent. In other words, the ordinary Iranian was getting petrol at a 10% of the actual price of producing that, that petrol. Mm -hmm. And they, they realized that this was unsustainable and they abolished the subsidy. And they, at the same time, they introduced a basic income for everybody with the money that they had saved. And they did it and they got away with it because people suddenly realized that they could afford the higher prices for petrol because they had the basic income. Now, the, 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 it succeeded. I mean, it's, it's happened, right? The world doesn't know much about it. And, and, and it's difficult for an advocate of basic income to cite this example uh, of success. A second thing that I, I, I think you should take account of in, in this discussion on, in response to your question, is that before 2004, no international aid was provided by the UN or World Bank for cash transfers, forms of basic income. Since 2004, there's been a gradual shift. I've been asked to speak to the World Bank in Washington and elsewhere to the IMF and to the, to the UN organizations. And they've done various analyses. And they've shown, without contradiction, that if they used aid to provide basic incomes, whether universal or quasi-universal basic incomes, they would reduce inequality, they would increase development, they would e increase economic growth, and that they would get more value for the money than other forms of aid. Now, Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF, was in the audience of one of my talks, and she said, yes, I agree. It would be, it would be a sensible way forward. The only thing that's stopping this becoming overwhelmingly the, the path of international aid, aid is politics. Mm -hmm. The idea that aid must be used to get benefits for the giving country or the giving institution. And the ideological bias in the World Bank and IMF in favor of building up private property rights and capitalist institutions. And I, I, but the analysts, the economists who've been doing the, the work, have actually shown that they, they would do much better economically and politically if they shifted to giving uh, most of the aid in the form of cash transfers and basic incomes as various documents testify. So we, we've got a contradictory position in the international community where the evidence shows that the basic income would be the best course, but politics and the ideology behind the aid agencies in the United States and elsewhere is blocking that a wholesale move. Well, let me ask you a question following up on the Iran thing, because I, I didn't know about that. But it would seem to me that if we remove the 90 percent subsidy, people are going to use less petroleum and that money that they get otherwise will be used for other things that's greener. Here in the United States, we have big things like big pharmacy companies, big beef companies. If a hamburger here in the United States might cost two or three dollars at a McDonald's, but if it wasn't subsidized by the government, it would be twenty dollars. So if we remove those subsidies from big beef, let's say, we uh, because all of this growing of cattle is far. I mean, it wastes so much. It leaves such a big carbon footprint versus, say, you know, more vegetarian type type lifestyles. So it would seem to me that 
a good part of basic income is removing subsidies from, from these outdated uh, uh, industries, giving it to the people, have them make the decisions uh, for themselves, and it, it would seem a greener alternative. Am I, is that correct? Definitely correct. All governments give vast amounts of their public revenue in the form of subsidies, mainly to corporations, mainly to middle and upper income groups, and they give billions and billions of dollars. I've, I've, I've gone through all the American subsidy schemes, and, and you've got hundreds of billions of dollars are given out in subsidies, mainly to rich individuals and rich corporations. Uh, and, and it's really scandalous what that's done. And various countries have to respond. So it's a tit for tat. If one country raises subsidies, then the next country has to raise subsidies for competitiveness reasons, and they tell their parliaments and the rest of it, we have to do it because Sri Lanka does it, Thailand does it, the United States does it, or whatever. And so that we ratchet it, we're ratcheting up subsidies. It's one of the scandals of the world that governments are spending out billions and billions of dollars or whatever in subsidies that go to the wealthy and using the, the subsequent budget deficit argument for saying they need to cut public social spending on benefits that would go predominantly for the poor and the precariat and so on. So we, we're in a contradictory situation and I've called it in my book and a, a special book on that subject, the corruption of capitalism because it isn't capitalism in the sense that you have free markets because subsidies block out any market mechanisms. Yeah. It, it, it undercuts and distorts markets, and, and it is unjustifiable ethically, uh, in equality, and in any other sense. So we have a, a, we have a real crisis of, govern, of governance, uh, and subsidies are the heart of this corruption. Uh, in this final segment, I, I just want to ask two basic questions uh, uh, of both of you. And uh, the first is, how do we fund universal basic income in a developed country and in an, a non-developed country? Let me start with Talal first. Uh, how would you fund UBI in Sri Lanka? Well, uh, what I like when I studied the budget uh, of last year, what I found was that like the amount that was spent on education, let's say roughly six billion uh, rupees, and then health. 8 billion. But then when I found out how much was uh, needed to repay debts, it was like 80 billion. So I mean, like, when education and health uh, spending was combined, we're still paying five times more than health and education combined just to pay back loans. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was saying earlier, like, we should, uh, what I believe is that stop uh, getting any more loans. And, uh, you know, if we cut cut off on the subsidies, I mean, we might be able to get by without any additional loans. And, like, with the country growing, I mean, with the GDP going at, like, 6 7% a year, and uh, so the tax revenues are going to increase as well. Maybe, like, uh, the amount that's going to be paid uh, as a percentage of the government revenue could come down. So I think, like, if uh, this thing, like... Uh, this was like uh, twice the debt repayment is like twice when you compare to education, health and subsidies. So what I feel is that once if we can tighten our belts for a few years and then, you know, get the debt ratio below, I think not just Sri Lanka, most of the countries around the world, especially the developing countries because of their uh, uh, rapid growth, can, uh, you know, free up themselves for a basic income very soon. This is my view. Uh, Guy, how about in the developed world? How do we fund UBI? I, I think that the justification for basic income is ethical and is a matter, first and foremost, a matter of social justice. It will also enhance freedom and give people basic security. If one takes that perspective and doesn't treat basic income as just a matter of dealing with poverty, which it, it does help with poverty. Then you come back to the basic arguments about social justice. 
And I've written a book recently, which is about to come out, which is called Plunder of the Commons. Now, all of us, our wealth and income, including all three of us, is far more to do with the achievements of previous generations of our respective societies than anything we do ourselves. And if you accept the private inheritance of wealth, the inheritance by rich people from their parents and grandparents and whatever, then one should also accept a social inheritance, a sort of social dividend on the collective wealth uh, of our societies. And in particular, we have to realize that the, the natural resources of our countries, whether they be rich or poor, are part of the commons. Yeah. They belong to all of us. They belong to all of us. And I believe that, in fact, the encroachment, enclosure, privatization of common resources is a justification for charging those who are benefiting from taking the, the, way, the income and wealth of those resources and building up a commons fund. Mm. And from the commons fund, as you build it up, you could pay out basic basic incomes that would rise. Yeah. As it happens, this is very close to what was done in Alaska. And it's also very close to what's being done in, in Norway with yeah. their oil revenues. But you don't have to have oil revenues in order to build up a common fund. I'm working with, with people in Goa, in India, who are building up the idea of a minerals fund, which you have to preserve the value, but you can distribute the proceeds, the profits, as it were, in basic income. And I think if we, if we perceive it in that way as common dividends, dividends that, that should be equal for everybody because this is part of our commons, if you see it in that way, then you, it becomes a matter of social justice. And one can justify carbon taxes, land taxes, wealth taxes, uh, all sorts of, of, of taxes or levies on use of various types of commons. And now, in particular, with the technological revolution and the, the data, big data by the big tech co uh, corporations, they're making billions of dollars or euros or pounds or whatever from access to the data that we generate. Yeah. Now, I don't believe that it makes sense to be paying each of us uh, some sort of individual sum depending on how much we use the internet, but I do believe that the, the big tech corporations are plundering the, the technological commons, the knowledge commons, and the intellectual commons, and, and they should be contributing in a big way to the building of a common fund from which we pay our basic income. And then finally, Dan, um, we go back to the subsidies question. We can roll back subsidies that are given to the wealthy and you automatically free up billions of dollars or pounds or whatever that can be paid out in basic income. You don't have to tackle, you don't have to reduce public education or public health, or public infrastructure. There's no argument, the libertarian argument, I totally reject. We need to keep the social state, but we can roll back those subsidies. In Britain, I've shown that the tax reliefs to the wealthy come to over 400 billion pounds per year. If you just use part of that money, you could pay out very decent basic incomes to all your citizens. So it's not a question of being unaffordable. It is eminently affordable. It's a matter of something being possible, but it's ultimately a political question. Yeah. And that is why I think the scare that Donald Trump and other neo-fascists are providing us is telling us, look, unless we provide people with basic security, we may see more political developments that none of us would want. Yeah. So I, I see it in that way. Uh, here in America, the myth of the common man who pulls himself up by the bootstraps, uh, it, 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 it's ridiculous. I mean, uh, we've forgotten about the common wheel, much less the public commons. Let me just ask Talal for a final comment here. Uh, Talal, what do you think uh, 
the chances are of getting UBI in Sri Lanka in the next decade? Uh, I think like, uh, well, we're just in the awareness stage, but I think like uh, as time goes, especially there's something that's, uh, that makes uh, basic income a bigger urgency. Like uh, uh, I would say like what Elon Musk and them say is like the coming automation. Like for example, like 4 million uh, truckers in the US will lose their jobs once you get automated trucks. So, I mean, I read an article by Scott Santons recently, yeah. and he was talking about like, uh, it's not just 4 million uh, drivers who are going to lose their income. It's like communities built on them, like uh, restaurants on the way, you know, and then fueling stations, people working there, then uh, schools uh, and, you know, other things, teachers, you know, it's a wider community. The same way in Sri Lanka, like, like the, uh, mm -hmm. truck community we have like uh, for example the took community like the three wheelers which people use instead of a taxi for example there are like uh, one million of them one million drivers dependent on that so the minute automation comes in you know most of these uh, tooks the three wheelers are owned by rich people who get pay these uh, drivers to run them so once it's automated, they'll just get rid of the drivers and then it will be running on its own. Yeah. So then you got like 1 million people without a job. I mean, not all of them can get jobs in AI or anything. I mean, they, they, most of them have barely passed A-levels. So, and uh, this is what I think, like many people, some of them could start a grocery store or work in this thing. But then like, even if like 250,000 people are out, and they cannot find a means to support their family and then they see, the, see their children starving, you know, this is the kind of thing that causes revolutions, like in France or Russia in 1917. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's when the urgency will come in for a basic income. So I think like with automation pushing in, though, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, in, uh, in India, there is more awareness, but in Sri Lanka, it's like basically like the topic is very new. But I think like uh, we are beginning to cause awareness. So I've been, I'm talking to like politicians. I'm going to do a press release uh, with a prominent politician and I want to have a conversation with the prime minister as well. So I think like once we get something on, especially if I, I'm trying my best to do something to get the topic in the presidential elections. So if we succeed, maybe the awareness and it can put something in so that the topic can come in the 2025. Okay. presidential election. So, I mean, I have to be practical. I mean, yeah. I don't think it's possible this year or in the coming year, but maybe the, it could become a mainstream topic, like the Green New Deal is in the US, like in, to be very reasonable, 2024, I okay. think it could be, and maybe we might be able to achieve in a decade. All right. Well, I want to thank both Talal and Guy for Hi. speaking on the subject, and I will link to Guy's website and Talal. I'll link to your Twitter page. People can contact you. Yes. There. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dan.